Uh, welcome to another episode of Inflection. I am Brian Berletic. Joining me as always is Angelo Giuliano. Hello, Angelo. How are you today? Hi, Brian. Doing great. Uh, we got a great topic today. Um, can you can you introduce the topic, uh, Brian? Sure. Well, we, we titled it, uh, Are We Anti-Western? And because we're accused of this all the time, because we say that we we point out a lot of really negative things about the West, and people then say, "Well, you just hate the West, obviously." But then, obviously, the things that we're pointing out are actual real problems. There are things that, if the West could actually prove other countries were doing, everybody would be outraged. They're outraged about things that are not even proven to be happening in these other countries. And so uh, we kind of want to set the record straight. We want to talk about how we ended up doing what we're doing and also um, you know, some of the things that we think are positive about the West. The West doesn't need us to promote them. We don't, they don't need us to promote things that they are doing that are that are good or perceived as good because that's all they do. And then the negative things that they do, they cover up or spin. So this is kind of like why we've ended up doing the sort of things that we do now. And uh, this is what we wanna talk about this episode. And so uh, we usually wait for question and answers uh, all the way at the end. But in this instance, how about we just do, like if we see anything uh, interesting pop up in the live comments, we could address that as we go along. So uh, I, I think people are probably familiar with both of our stories, but uh, Angela, why don't you go first? How did you get into uh, kind of geopolitics, uh, pointing these things out, and um, how have people accused you of being anti-Western? And what do you say to that? Well, I, I think it's uh, it's important just to to look at uh, you know this journey. I mean, my 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 Chinese journey, how I came to China. So China was for me a passion. I wanted to come to China since I was 15, you know, so, so I've been there like 25 years. From day one, my whole personality and perception change, you know, it, it changes and, and it kept on changing gradually. Uh, and the thing is that um, at the beginning, I think a lot of foreigners that come to Asia, uh, we are kind of arrogant because we, we, we come in and we, we, we don't understand why, why are they so different, the way they approach, why the culture is... Why they should be doing this like like this way? You know, it's just it's just we we, we just don't understand, and, and we, we sometimes become arrogant because we we think oh they should be doing that way. You know, that's the way it should be done, and so on. And slowly you become more humble. You just realize well, you know what? There's so much history. We are just different. You know, the approach and and especially the lenses. If you start changing your lenses, trying to look from Chinese perspective, Thai perspective, you know, they have, there's so much history. And, and, and you know what, after 25 years, you just become humble. You just realize, well, you know what, maybe I should just try to be neutral. Try to, to look from their perspective. Try to learn from their history, where they come from. Why are they like this? And, and, and then when, they, when there's this injustice, you, you've seen things firsthand in the country and you see you see prosperity so many good things and you see the the western media bashing on china and actually the implication of that all these manufacturing consent preparing the mind of people for potential war and that makes it very worrying but then at the end of the day i i want to tell people i, I might not be that i'm not pro-china in, in itself I, i'm actually against that injustice. You see, ultimately, you are American, Brian. I am Swiss and I'm Italian. You know what, I, this, I, I'm not gonna change. No matter if I stay 50 years in China, I'm not gonna change. I'm still a foreigner and I'm a guest in China. Uh, but there's injustice, China, you know, there's injustice. Why, why are they lying so much? And I think this is our responsibility to bridge you know, to bridge those two worlds and to explain to people, well, you know what, I've lived there and, and what the Western media are telling you is it's not true. You know, it's not true. China is not perfect. There's not a single country that is perfect, you know, but it needs to be good for Chinese. If Chinese around me all tell me that they're happy, they have prosperity and it's going to the right direction, 
well, you know what? It needs to be good for them. And the same for the U.S. You know what? Who am I to tell Americans how they should run their own country? You know, I can give my opinions. But, but again, you know, if, if we really value democracy, it's about valuing humanity and understanding each other's differences and, and, and growing together. You know, not, not imperialism. Imperialism kills. Imperialism is, is oppressive. It's, it, it contains the 90% of the world, you know, and, and, and there's an anomaly here. Why a country like the US, which is 4% of the world's population, should be ru ruling over the rest of the world? And, and that, there's an anomaly here. That, that, there's a problem. Yes. Uh, so, you know, for me personally, I just want to, well, first of all, I wanted to, to find, uh, I want to find a graph that shows the percentage by nation. Let me see if I can find that. Pop world, world population by percent. Uh, and uh, before that, before we get into that, oh, well, here it is. Let's take a look. Let me see if I can open this. All right. Well, why, okay. What's going on here? <laughs> uh, okay, so here it is. Open a new tab right here. Okay, so right there is the United States, 4.3%. This is the same United States that just announced their summit for democracy. And uh, they unilaterally decided who was going to be invited and who wasn't. They're going to tell everyone in the world who is and isn't democratic. They're going to talk about human rights violations. And uh, invitations were handed out by U.S. President Joe Biden, who who just got done wrapping up this uh, horrific murder of an entire family in Afghanistan, including seven children, 10 people in total, uh, for no reason at all, thousands of miles from U.S. borders. And this is the U.S. who will presume to tell the entire planet who is and isn't democratic. Right here, 4.3% of the world population. Look at India and China. Why, why does the U.S. get this oversized say in anything. I just don't understand it. And when you understand history, uh, the imperialism, Western imperialism, and the, the racist roots that uh, hold it up, basically, even to this day, then you start to understand something is extremely wrong with this picture. Now, Angela, you were talking about when, when you went to China. When I first went overseas, uh, I was I was an American. I joined the, the U.S. Marine Corps. I was very patriotic. Uh, and from from the cradle, I was told that America was the best country in the world. And I don't think America even pretends to, to be humble. It openly says that, yes, it is the greatest country in the world. Uh, and it gets to say who is and isn't democratic. Like, I, I don't think that they even see a problem with that, that picture that we were just showing. 4.3% uh, telling the rest of the world what to do. And this is kind of the attitude that I had when I first stepped foot in Japan. I saw people protesting the, the presence of U.S. troops on their soil. And I said, what's wrong with them? I mean, we're here to protect them. This is the mentality that I had as an American at the time. But uh, when you start to go out into town, you start t seeing how Japanese people live and you start realizing all, all of these stereotypes and all of these stories that you were told about how people in Asia think and act and what motivates them. When you see that that's all lies, you start, you have a choice. You could be delusional and lie to yourself to, to keep up all of these perceptions that you had in your head so you don't have to change. Or you could start questioning everything that you thought you knew and start looking for the truth of the matter. And this is a, a process that I've went through over many years. And it wasn't, it wasn't a smooth process. And I didn't suddenly wake up one day and know everything. It was a very long process to sort all of this out. Uh, um, so yeah, I see a lot of people talking about the diplomatic uh, boycott, <laughs> the US diplomatic boycott of the Chinese Olympics. So they're going to boycott the Olympics here. Again, this is not hating, um, this is not hating the West or hating the US when you point out blatant hypocrisy. The US is accusing China of, of genocide. For years now, they've been doing this and they have not produced any evidence at all. And when you ask them, they, they have this long process of trying to justify it, uh, th these claims, but they can't just show you, you know, here's the proof. They cannot do that. They got this long song and dance because there is no proof. And yet the US is openly, blatantly slaughtering people that, that family in Afghanistan, they did absolutely nothing wrong. They're dead. Uh, and I want to share people 
uh, this right here. Maybe I'm kind of going all over the, the place here, but this is deadly U.S. drone strike in Kabul did not break law. Pentagon says we talked about this last week, Angelo, and we, we talked about how the inspector, this uh, lieutenant general said it was an honest mistake. No laws were broken. How do you murder a family on the other side of the planet, thousands of miles from your own borders and not break any laws? What kind of country, what kind of system, what kind of rule of law is taking place when that does not break any any law? So I started noticing things like this. I started seeing things like this that were just so blatant when you start walking back and being objective and the way the media presents it. And you're asking yourself, why, why isn't anyone... Why isn't anyone talking about this stuff? This is what starts getting you to question things. Questioning things and pointing out things that are blatantly wrong. This does not make you anti-American or, or anti-Western. Now, we're going to talk about some of the things that we think are positive about the West. And because and I'm an American, things that I think are positive about the U.S. And I have talked about these things. I just, there's so many bad things that aren't being addressed that this occupies most of my time. But I have actually done videos about things that I think are positive that are taking place in the US. And I've written articles over the years too, focusing on this. Um, uh, but before I, I jump around anymore, uh, Angelo, uh, pe people have accused you of being anti-Western. What, what do you say to people like this? No, but uh, I I love I love the West and, and the culture that the West has. I you see the thing is that we should actually ch cherish our differences. Um, it's just uh, what I want to point out is we we have individualistic uh, society, so everything is 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 focused on on freedom of individuals. Um, there are more complex societies. You know, Asians don't don't look it, don't don't see it that way. They look in terms of society. Uh, so they are going to adapt a system, economic system, and also political system that is adapted to their own culture. So the thing is that what we are, what we have in the West is uh, is still at at the infancy stage. Democracy is very young, and it's actually it's it's imperfect. So why uh, why would you want to to export and impose it on China? And, and you've seen the the track record, you know that we. They, they wanted to impose the, the Western-style democracy in, in Arab countries. What, what, what happened? I mean, revolution, chaos. And, and while uh, Arab countries, they, they have a tradition to be, to be tri tribal. You know, they sit around the table, you know, tribes, and, 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 and they need someone that actually, like Saddam Hussein or Gaddafi, that actually is there as a referee. So it's different. Uh, China, China, they found a system, and actually, when you look at the Chinese system, is is not much different than you know, what it had for the last two thousand years. You know, it's a, it's re, it's been readjusted. It's a, it's a system of meritocracy. It was always like this. You know, if you, it's a system of selection and election. The selections was was through you know exams, uh, you know imperial exams. You had to pass those exams, which were very difficult. So at the end of the day, you had like people that were very capable for running the country. And so why would you want to change that? It's been working, and 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 actually, you see the result. It's been in the last forty years. Now, now I think one of the problems that the West has is that the the West needs to understand that the largest population is the is in the global south. China is four times the population of the U.S. So. It must, by definition, it must become at least two to three times the, the, the GDP of the U.S. You know, it's just something just natural. It's just, it's just mathematics. You know, you have, you have four times the population of the U.S. Well, it's normal. It's growing. There's prosperity. And, and why would you want to contain that? You know, because now what you see in the last 40 years, it was only about containing the global south. But the problem is that the global south is so much. There's so much more population. So what do you want to do? In order to keep hegemony, you want to keep the, the most of the world poor. Do you call this humanity? I mean, where is your humanity? You know, uh, you see. But the, the the thing is that now neo-colonialism is much more sophisticated. Colonialism, imperialism used to be like having soldiers on the ground and controlling, you know, just being there. 
Now it's, it's, it's a different way. It's through coercion. It's through sanctions. It's uh, through meddling. You know, it, and it's so much in contradictions to, to what we say. You know, we, we complain about meddling when we are the, actually the one meddling. So it's, what we are doing, you and I, is just about telling those, those things that are hypocritical. You know, yeah. and again, I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not saying that the, the societies we're living in, in uh, you or, or, or in Thailand and in, 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 in China, they're perfect. They're, they're not, you know, they, they have their problems, corruption and so on. But then ultimately they have to deal with their own stuff, not us, not us. And we need to, to, to stop the, this, this vicious, vicious circle. Uh, and, and now we're going against we're going against history. You know, I mean, really, when you want to contain China now, at this stage, it's completely madness. Where are we going? We're going uh, into a hot war. Who's going to win? You know, we, we don't want that. Uh, ultimately, you know what? If the day that there's no more tensions, you know, man, I, I'm out of YouTube. I'm, I have other stuff to do. And I, I guess you, you have too. We have families. We, we'd rather spend time with our families. I mean, yeah. are we are we are we looking for for you know like uh, uh, exposure and so on? No, no, it's it's not. We we have other stuff to do. But then I think it's our responsibility to come out and say, well, you know what? You've lived in 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 Thailand for two decades. I've lived in China for twenty five years. Well, you know, we have something to say, and and and, and, and it's a peaceful. It's about peace. You know, we want to bring bring peace. The, the reason we are doing what we are doing is that we fear war and we want to bring peace because the, those tensions we are seeing here, it's just a product of ignorance and greed yeah. and greed. I was actually just going to go. I was actually just going to go into that because um, I wanted to show people this. I want to show people the sort of things that I point out that the U.S. is doing. People will accuse me of being anti-American for always talking about things like this. But if you see a headline like this and this doesn't make you angry, there's something something seriously wrong with you. If you're an American and you see the U.S. do something like this and you don't feel angry about that, that that's being done in your name, they murdered an entire family for no reason and no one was held accountable. How are you okay with that? And this goes back to this, this uh, mentality that we as Americans are brought up with, that we are superior, whatever we do is fine. Uh, these people are inferior, so who cares anyway? They're good. Well, yeah, I've heard people say, well, they're gonna kill each other anyway. What difference does it make if we owe some collateral there? I've heard people talk like that. Uh, Americans talk like that. And where does that all come from? That's not Americans being horrible people. people are people everywhere you go in the world. There's good people, there's bad people. What's going on in the U US is very, very deliberate. So I looked at this uh, Gallup poll. New high in perceptions of China as US's greatest enemy. Where did this come from? Did Americans objectively study this and draw these conclusions themselves? Where, uh, let's go look at this. This is where you see it bouncing around. The green line is China. It's bouncing around. And then it suddenly shoots up. Why did it suddenly shoot up? Because negative media coverage suddenly shot up. This is directly uh, related to uh, the media. The media is putting these ideas into Americans' heads. And then uh, the politicians have their policy that they're going with. And the media has to sell the policy to the people. It's democracy in reverse. Democracy is supposed to be people uh, who have representatives who represent their interests and are carrying it out in Washington. In this case, Washington and Wall Street set the agenda, and then the media puts it on the American people. And I remember, this is what they did to me. And then you start seeing little things pop up here and there. Like when I was in the Marines and uh, after 9-11, I, I started to do some research. I totally bought into the whole war on terror narrative, and I started looking into the, the, the background of Islam. And I read the Quran myself because I, I was sincerely interested in what might be in this book that has made people extremists. And what I realized was all of these things that I was told were in the Quran are lies. It's little cherry picked quotes taken out of context. When you look at the context, you, you understand that you are being lied to. There is something else going on here. Then it's just a matter of uh, unraveling those lies, unraveling these, uh, these narratives that are covering up the real agenda. 
uh, someone is asking about Ethiopia. You know, there is something definitely going on in Ethiopia. Uh, this is like, um, this is a totally unrelated issue to the episode today, but I'm looking into it. My, my specialty is not, I mean, I cover mainly Asia and Southeast Asia. And Angelo, you're, you know, you were in Hong Kong and you got started because of the Hong Kong protests. Uh, I think, check out the gray zone because I think the gray zone has been covering Ethiopia. Uh, they do a really great job and they also do a great job covering Latin America. So uh, we like, we're only just a handful of people and you know, we have like our different regions of the planet that we're covering. I wish that I could cover all of these things. Uh, yeah, but but yeah that's, I would suggest, yeah. I would suggest, I take sometimes a, a bit of shortcut just to have some ideas when it comes like, for example, in Ethiopia, you know, it's uh, how I, it's how uh, this African country is standing on the Belt and Road Initiative and the relationship with the US and China. Because what we yeah. are seeing all around the world is uh, those tensions and those uh, proxy wars, the same as the uh, Solomon Islands, you know, who, who are behind and what, what's the agenda? When you have like people coming out in the street and saying, oh, we want uh, to reestablish a relationship with Taiwan. I mean, my question is, what does it bring to your country? I mean, why are you in the street? And then you dig in a little bit and you, you find out that uh, there's 25 million US dollars uh, uh, by US aid, which is, which is financing a minority against the other. And, uh, yeah. and, 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 and there's a tension behind this is, is uh, the agenda on who are you going to recognize China or Taiwan? Uh, yeah. I just want to add, add up one thing about what you said just uh, before about how the media and the West is shaping the mind of people. And there's a very good book by Noam Chomsky is, uh, and I think that was a, uh, it was a major, major book for me that, that changed my perceptions was uh, manufacturing, manufacturing consent. So it's basically all this propaganda and, and you know, it, it goes into the subconscious mind that overnight you just become anti-China because what you're hearing from morning till evening is things that are anti-Chinese. But then look at the media five, six years ago. You didn't have this anti-Chinese stuff. But in reality, China hasn't changed. China yeah. has been still working hard for their own people. It hasn't changed. The policy didn't change. So why our perception changed? And you see, and actually, this, yeah. Well, actually, I was I was going to say a lot of the issues that China was having, they have been actually solving. They've been solving it and improving. And as as they're improving, the it was very bizarre. The U.S. just uh, w went at after them. And I, I think that was because of, uh, this is a historical thing a lot of people don't understand. The U.S. honestly thought they were going to subordinate China to the U.S. into this international order. And it totally failed. They were going to put the manufacturing in China and then they were going to flip the government and then they were going to have an obedient client regime in Beijing. And then they were going to uh, incorporate that and the rest of Asia into their international order. Totally didn't work. And then uh, I think they were still toying with the idea of enticing China to, to come in and just kind of subordinate itself and, and get some benefits, but ultimately keep their, you know, keep their place beneath the West. And China has no reason to do that. There's no reason for China to do that. Why would a country with uh, four times the population of, of the US and soon to have a larger economy, no matter what the US does, why would they do that? It makes no sense. And so that, when they realized that that wasn't going to work, they it's like a switch was flipped, just like you said, Angelo. And uh, even Australia, they had this very constructive, pro uh, very prosperous relationship with China. And then it's like they just slit their wrists and bled themselves out because the U.S. told them to. It's so, so bizarre and desperate and also dangerous. Uh, Angelo, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, no. Um, well, think about it, you know, the arrogance to assume that Chinese, uh, they will want, uh, they will want to become like us. I mean, that's the assumption from the West. Yeah. I mean, how arrogant, uh, but, but, but then it's arrogant, but it's also a lot of ignorance. You know, China, China I mean, the, the culture is so different. Why, why the Chinese would want to become like Westerners? They're not. And, and see, in reality, the actually Ch Chinese, they're happy to travel abroad. There's 160 million Chinese that travel abroad. And you know what? All of them come back. Maybe in the 60s, 70s, whoever had the opportunity to go abroad from China, actually they would stay abroad because you were, they, they gained a the status. It was good to go, to go abroad and, and it was more prosperous. But you know what? 
there's, there's not only those 160 million Chinese come back, but then you have second gen generation of Chinese. They all go back to China and they start learning Chinese and they, because they, they know there are, there, are, there are much more opportunities. And you see there's, there's hundreds of uh, hundred thousands of, of foreigners living in China. Talk to them. You know, we never, those Western media never interview uh, foreigners that live in China because they, they are inconvenient truth there. You know, they will tell you, I have a good life in China. What are you saying? I mean, blaming China and so on. Just, you know, and especially when you look at, at the, you know, all the changes. Yeah. You know, and again, again, I think, you know, well, Chinese, there's a saying that says, you know, if you want to, to have a clear view on something, you need to, to know about the history, you know, you need to know about the present and you need to understand where it is going. And they don't have, you know, if you, it's not a snapshot, you know, when you judge a country, it's the same as a person. I will never be objective if I judge Brian as a snapshot now. I need to understand where you come from. You know what? Brian is someone that actually was an ex-Marine and he went through a process of growing and learning. And, and, and this is what, where Brian is now. But, but you've been, you, you had contact with the, you know, a, a, a colored revolution in 2010. You were confronted yeah. with colored revolution, US back color revolution. The same as me. And, and you know what, what people lack is this tangible contact with this reality. Yeah. What people, you know, the, the perception that people have when it comes to China or Thailand or other countries, it's only through Hollywood, through mass media. You know, you need to spend time in that country. And you know what? That's not easy. It's a love and hate relationship when you are in that country because, because ultimately you are a foreigner and you're struggling with all those differences. Why do they think like this? Why do they react like this? You, you know, I give you some, just small examples, anecdotes, you know. When I was in Taiwan, the first day I arrived, you know, I was in a culture shock. And they, I mean, people would ask me, did you eat? All the time, all the time. And you know what was with me? And I was getting like frustrated. Why, why would you say that? And you know, actually it's an expression saying, I, how are you doing? You know, so you're not supposed to, even if you didn't eat, you're not supposed to say no. But those are all so many differences. And, and you know yeah. what? Just accept it. Accept those differences and cherish them. You know, the world is not going to be, you know, this global thing that we are all going to, to, to have American values and so on. No. Well, why don't we cherish those differences? You know, differences are good, you know. And, and, uh, but, but, you know, we need to, 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 to build you know, this, this, this humanity to, to try to, uh, and tolerance to, to understand each other and live together. Yeah. And you know, it's, you know, it's, uh, might be at the, the root of it is you, you see Americans and actually people across the West, they got this obsession. Angela, if you have to like, uh, get, no, get no, something, no, sorry. That's no, no, okay. No, no. <laughs> uh, you know, they have this idea of where they need to constantly be in control. And then when they come to, say, a place like Thailand, they're not in control anymore. And they they feel like um, they should be. And this they builds this resentment over time if they don't learn how to adjust to how things are done in Thailand. It's totally different. People are very complex. And then societies are very complex. And then history and culture is very complex. It's not divided neatly into chapters like it is in a textbook. And if you you don't just, you know, just, just be an observer, be objective, uh, clean, clear the slate, and start learning. If you can't do that, you're going to be fighting the entire time you're someplace else. And, and you even see in America now the way people are fighting with each other. Everyone has to have it exactly their way. There's no room for, for tolerance. There's no room for compromise. And you see how it's tearing society apart. Uh, and, and, and then Americans and other Westerners, they bring this attitude with them when they go overseas. And they, they just like, I see so many people here, Westerners here. And uh, when I first got here, I kind of was like that, not, not so much, but even, even I had to uh, very incrementally learn how to stop uh, fighting everything and just learn to be quiet and listen and learn because there's so much to learn. Uh, Thai people have a completely way of looking at things. Uh, one thing that I will say, Thai people are extremely, extremely tolerant 
and um, patient, and they they try to stay calm. You you not see. I mean, it happens from time to time because they're they're human beings like everyone else. But you not see them uh, flipping out suddenly. You know, having an outburst. This is this is considered losing face. It's uh, not not a very desirable characteristic to have in Thai society. And so uh, I've learned a lot, and I, it's kind of rubbed off on me over the years. Uh, but in the beginning, I didn't understand it, and I was like, Why aren't you? more upset about this why like even people will say look at all the stuff the us is doing to thailand why doesn't thailand just like you know uproot it all like overnight why don't they throw this guy in jail why did they let him go back to france and, and things like that it's because it's just their way of of doing things and they've been doing it for centuries <laughs> and it works and uh, they've been doing it longer than the us has been a country so there might be some wisdom there that we're 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 gonna miss out if we constantly try to lecture instead of listen and learn. Um, I, I wanted to go on to this guy right here, Matthew Pot Pottinger. Is this? He's the only guy that I've ever heard watch the U.S. lie about weapons of mass destruction, invade Iraq, kill a million people, and then he saw that he's like, I need to join the military. I need to join the U.S. <laughs> military and help out. You know, he's the, like, this is the only case I've ever heard where someone admitted this very bizarre and he was he was part of the uh, Trump administration so he's not just some some guy he's part of the US government and he he still is kind of influential when it comes to China and he's one of these guys who will say I don't hate the Chinese people I love Chinese people I love Chinese culture we hear this a lot I just hate the Chinese government uh, and you were, you were saying before the show the Chinese government, is is the Chinese people and, and vice versa. And in a lot of ways, so is the US government. And I just wanted to pick this out. Uh, I guess that's him right there with President Trump. I just wanted to kind of say, I'm not, I'm not like that. I'm not the equivalent of Matthew Pottinger, but in reverse. I think every country should pick the way it wants to run its own affairs. If the US, if Americans feel that their form of government is the way they like it, the way they want it to be, that's fine. I'm not ever going to say, oh, the US should do things like China or like Thailand. That's ridiculous. That's uh, frankly, it's quite ridiculous to say that. They should do things the way they want. The only problem that I have is when the US or any other country for that matter decides to take what they're doing inside their own borders and impose it on someone else. That is injustice. That We wouldn't accept it if someone came into our house and told us how to to live our daily lives, we wouldn't like that. And it's wrong when a country does it to another country. And this is this is the actual problem I have with the US. Not with the way the US government is, not with the way Americans run their internal political affairs. Even if it's right now, looks like absolute chaos, that's their problem to work out on their own. No one else from the outside has a right to, to interfere and, and lecture them on how they should or shouldn't do things. The problem is when that crosses their border, when that is imposed on someone else, that is injustice. This is what we speak up uh, against. You you could look through all of my work. You're not going to find a lot of commentary from me about America's internal political affairs. Even though I am an American, it's, it's kind of my business. But I, I, I mostly focus on geopolitics and the impact of U.S. interference abroad. Uh, and th this is how I feel like I'm different than someone like Matthew Pottinger, who's an American uh, who is butting in on China's internal political affairs and passing judgment on it and claiming there is this need to change the way China is doing things inside its own borders. It's so wrong. Uh, it's so blatantly wrong to, to be like that. And I, I just want to distinguish myself and probably Angelo, you feel the same than these people who say they don't they don't hate the Chinese people, they just hate the government. I'm not even going to say that about the US. I'm just going to say my problem with the US is when it's meddling abroad, blatantly wrong. This is this is my issue. And I don't think that makes me anti-American at all. No country has a right to impose itself on another country. Angela, you have any um, any input on this? No, I just, uh, I was thinking, uh, remember, uh, when, when you look at the, the protest, the US-backed protest, uh, both in Thailand and in Hong Kong, you see that they've been uh, brainwashing those kids into self-hating their own country. I mean, those kids are going against the monarchy, they're going against the, the history, they're even going against uh, what they eat, you know, they, they'd rather eat a uh, hot dog and hamburgers, you know, they, and not, not Asian food, I mean, which is ridiculous. 
uh, and then you have uh, you have uh, in Hong Kong like those kids that were uh, they had like uh, foreign flags, you know, it's just just all this um, this foreign meddling, you know, and, and and then what we are doing, you and I, is just very simple. It's just uh, you know follow the money. Why you have someone like Pottinger, you know, I mean, he's paid for that. Ultimately, you know, it's just, uh, you you see, I mean, those media who, you know, the, just the funding, just look at the funding. And, and so sometimes some are, are led by ideology, but ultimately, if they are working for a think tank, which is paid, which is financed by the military industrial complex, well, you know what, you, that's all about money. The day that there's no cold war between China and the the in the US, well, you're out of job, you know, so yeah. there's lots of people, also some influencers, you know, anti-Chinese uh, influencers, well, you know, they, they, they're they seeking clicks, exposure, so the more they demonize China, the better it is. The, the, the same as uh, Sky, Sky News, think about it, whenever, you know, it's all about sensational stuff about China, and you know what, because they know this sells, you, you sell fear, you know, people watch, you know, otherwise there's no more exposure. CNN, the, the, the exposure of CNN, they had lots of clicks for a long time, you know, views uh, during Trump because it was all about uh, Russia Gate. And so this is dangerous because we're selling sensationalism and, and it's actually polarizing the world. It's very dangerous. And people don't have, you know, they don't have the distance. You know, they need to have a distance. To, to, to have a better view of the, the whole picture, you know, and it's never white or black, you know, it's, a, it's very dangerous to have this binary approach. You are either my enemy or my friend, you know, it's extremely dangerous. Yeah, uh, it, it lacks sophistication. And I, I don't think that the US media anytime soon will ever be accused of being sophisticated in that sense. Uh, now, I, so, so the the point of this this show, this episode today, is um, you know trying to explain how we're not anti-Western and how we have a very specific thing that we have a problem with. So, uh, the U.S. and the West in general imposing itself on other countries. This this is you can look in your 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 text your history textbook from grade school. There was a thing called imperialism, and it's something that is still going on today, and it's just plain wrong and speaking up against that is there's nothing that makes you anti-American or anti-Western for disagreeing with someone's foreign policy. We're not trying to change the system of governance in the US or in Europe to, to make it more like the, the systems that we are familiar with living in Asia for so long. We're not trying to do that at all. Now, I wanted to kind of show some things that I think are positive about, I, I'm an American, so I, I'm gonna show a couple of things that are positive about the US and then Angelo, perhaps Europe in general, and maybe narrow it down to Switzerland, because I, I wanna show that, uh, that it's not, oh, I hate everything about the US. I'm not gonna eat American food. Um, I'm, I hate absolutely, it's not like that at all. It's very, uh, it's an easy thing to accuse someone of when you don't wanna do a real debate. So um, people don't have to like Elon Musk, but the guy is, he's smart, he's very successful. And he says a lot of things that really do make sense. Sometimes he says things that are really uh, absent-minded or even insulting. Uh, but in this case, and the link to this is in the video description below, and I, I set it up so that it starts right where the conversation about China begins. And uh, it's muted, but maybe you can see on the, the subtitles on the screen if you can like multitask and listen and read at the same time, I don't know. but. This you, this uh, Air Force general is basically asking Elon. You know, he's he's completely uh, indoctrinated. He's got this U.S. versus China. China is a, a problem. It's rising. We have to stop it from rising. And again, it makes no sense. And it's such a larger a larger population than the U.S. All things being equal, it should have a larger economy. And that's what Elon Musk says. He says they got a huge population. They're going to have a larger economy. There's nothing you can do about it. The people there are hardworking. They're educated. Why, why do you think that that's a bad thing? There's a lot of things that they're going to do that will be amazing. This, is not a, this isn't something to be afraid of. And the general brings up all of these uh, talking points like, what about intellectual property? And Elon Musk says about Tesla, he says, all of our patents are open source. Anyone can take them. Well, purpose, which is to 
switch over from hydrocarbons to electric, that this is his goal. And this is what he's dedicated to. And this is, he puts his money where his mouth is. Those patents are open source. Any company can use them. Uh, and he's talking about the importance of innovation. This is, this is the kind of thing that you will see a lot of Americans talking about. This is maybe like an American kind of value that, that's highly valued in the US. This is a good thing about the US. And I think uh, Elon Musk has a lot of shortcomings. But in this case, and in this sense, this is a positive thing. This is a positive example of America, uh, American thinking and America seeing itself as a constructive partner on the global stage among other nations, rather than this obsession that this US Air Force general has of imposing itself on all other nations. And uh, Elon Musk, he's got his uh, Tesla factory in Shanghai and it makes more cars in China than they do it back in the US. He also has this company, um, SpaceX. Again, uh, all, all of the links to all of this stuff is in the video description below. Uh, this is breakneck innovation. This is world leading innovation in aerospace. And this is something that the US was falling behind on until Elon Musk came along. And uh, this is Starship. This is this is actually the second stage of a much larger, ro the largest, most powerful rocket on earth. Uh, this is something that's going on in the US. This is this is good. This is what a large industrialized nation should be doing. It should be doing uh, never seen before innovation that excites people, uh, that is moving all of humanity forward together. And again, Elon Musk sees other companies taking his idea for reusable launch systems and, and like the Falcon 9 and now Starship. And he says it's good. I, he wants people to copy him. He wants everyone. He wants uh, when the tide rises, all the boats to rise together. This is very positive. I think this is something a lot of Americans think and and do that is extremely positive. And, and then I, I just want to, in contrast, Boeing, this deeply entrenched American aerospace company, Boeing, that takes billions of dollars from the US government and does nothing with it. This was their spa uh, pat uh, manned space capsule, still hasn't flown anyone to space yet. Uh, Elon Musk's uh, Dragon capsule has sent multiple crews to the International Space Station. So it's just, I, I just want to compare and contrast. This is Boeing is everything that's wrong with the US and SpaceX is uh, an example of some of the more positive things about the US. There's, it's not everything is terrible. It's not everything is great. It's more complicated than that. You have to learn to, to go through it. When the US does something that's good, give them credit where credit is due. Don't just uh, smear them uh, in generalizations, that's wrong. We don't like that when the U.S. does it to other countries. We shouldn't do that back to the U.S. Angela, you want to jump in because uh, yes, the U.S. Yes. is a country that imposes itself on everyone. So I think everyone gets a say in what's going on with the U.S. Angela? Well, I was thinking about, uh, you know, Cyrus Johnson, uh, he, he does a really uh, great job, you know, in, in explaining what China is. And he, very often he says, uh, imagine if the U.S. and China could work together what the world could be just joining forces together uh, in terms of infrastructure you know like uh, in common prosperity would be just amazing you know china had uh, had a proposal to the us you know in terms of for the belt and road initiative it said it was willing just to invest massively in a railway uh, railway uh, roads from from actually beijing to washington think about it 200 billion yeah. US dollar linking Beijing to Washington. So it would go from, from China to Russia, the Antarctic, you know, and, and then and then Alaska, Canada, all the way down to to Washington. I mean yeah. that you know that is the ambition, not that China has, but not for China, for the world. Imagine if we had common aspiration. You see, there's a you mentioned airspace programs. You know why? Why you have two separate programs now? The the yeah. the Americans and the Europeans didn't want China to join. Well, you know what? China is going on their own, but they they could do it together. Now there's the next stage. I mean, really, this is some amazing stuff which is going to happen in the next decade. It's about the space. You know, space exploration. There's so much to do there. That's there is a revolution happening now. Well, you you know what? What the U.S. did in those last few years, it created an entity which is airspace force. They are preparing for the war 
in the space. Yeah. Which is going to be parallel, you know, it's going to be on on soil, you know, on, on earth, and it's going on to be on space. Why don't you to work together for space exploration? That is my frustration because the world could be so much better. And it's about the rich countries containing the poor. Yeah. And the poor is 90% of the world. Why would you want to do that? You know, and, and a lot of people, you see, they, they, they have no contact with poverty, with what really imperialist is doing around the world. I just came back from Venezuela. I saw people, I mean, starving, going on a daily, daily basis. Just they didn't know if, if tomorrow they would have food in the fridge. And why? Because of sanctions. Why the sanctions? Because you want to contain countries and people because you, you, you build up your wealth out of those poor nations, you know, and it's been lasting for, for hundreds of years. So if you call yourself human and you really cherish human rights, well, you know, just give the chance to, to a, a different world where we have equal chances and we, we will have democracy at the UN level. Because democracy, you know, you cannot, you cannot actually claim to have democracy in your own country, but then you have a unipolar world where you don't consult other countries and you don't, you, you don't care about what, you know, the real democracy, which should be happening at the UN level. Yeah, uh, it's, it's all about a lack of balance of power. And this is something the West has deliberately tried to maintain a, an imbalance of power in favor of the West. And everything that you see them doing, like the, the sanctions on Venezuela or trying to knock China down or this resistance to working with Russia. And you, you were talking about cooperating in space. The U.S. and Russia, despite all of their differences everywhere else, they were working in space and they were achieving things that neither nation on their own could achieve. That's just like a little microcosm of what's possible. And if you could imagine the U.S. and Russia and China all working together, what that would mean. And, and then you see, because of the, the U.S., its desperation to maintain this world order, just like, just like what you said, it's a, a world order of imbalance, of injustice. Uh, they, do not want, they do not want equity around the world. They want it to be them controlling everything. And it's just a continuation of this racist imperialist project that goes back generations. And it's, it's antiquated. It's backwards. It's unsustainable. And you can see China's Belt and Road Initiative investing in infrastructure in these countries, building these countries up, meaning that it'll be harder for China if in the future somehow they, they decided, oh, we want to take advantage of this country. It'll be much harder because they're helping build these countries up right now. They're creating a world order based on balancing things, multipolarism, whereas the U.S. is trying to maintain this uh, unipolar world order where it's an imbalance. It's a cul-de-sac. Imperialism is a cul-de-sac. One thing that history teaches us over and over and over again is that imperialism is a dead end. And I think people in China have figured that out. I think that's why they have a completely different approach. I think the, the emergence of multipolarism are nations collectively waking up to this reality that they don't want to keep going around in this circle because it's not even good for them. Even if it, they're at the top, eventually they'll end up at the bottom. And I think that's uh, people, a lot of people in America see that that's what's happening. They're right on the edge of going down because of this. And it, it should be changed before it's too late. Um, Angela, anything else you want to throw? And I was going to go over a couple of other examples here. I was going to, it's actually, I was going to say like, this guy, he's not American, he's Canadian, Curtis Stone. He's, you know, the, the urban farmer. And I, I just wanted to point out that there's a lot of Westerners who are presenting some of the best solutions to a lot of the problems we face in the world today. So like uh, everyone knows big ag, Monsanto, GMO, uh, chemicals. This is, a, this is a danger to everyone on earth. No nation has clean hands in this. And Curtis Stone was a guy who figured out how to do this on his own, on a very small amount of land. And then he started teaching people, not, not just in Canada, but all over the world. And then he used his channel uh, to help build up other people, to showcase their businesses based on, on this mentality of local agriculture. And he's actually making a huge difference by, by encouraging people to get into local agriculture. If people are into local ag agriculture, growing and buying locally, what does that do to these giant agricultural corporations? It's shifting the balance of power from a small handful of people monopolizing everything and redistributing it evenly over the rest of, of the country, the region, the world. So uh, like I'm not anti-American and I'm not anti-Western because 
some people in the West have the, the best ideas, the best solutions to the problems uh, about the things that a lot of people see as negative in the West. Uh, so that there's that. And I wanted to show you this also. This You probably never heard of this. This is a girl who had leukemia. She was about one week away from dying. She was literally on her deathbed. And so they did this experimental gene therapy where they take your, your blood cells and they re-engineer them to recognize the leukemia because the reason your body can't beat leukemia is because it cannot see it. Your immune system cannot see it. So they reprogrammed your immune system to see it. They put the blood cells back into her body through an IV. And it, in about a week, it cleared out her leukemia and she has been cancer free. This, this was her one year after it and now eight years because your blood cells, all of your cells in your body, they, they reproduce. When they do, they make a copy of themselves. So they copied the information that was engineered into them to see the leukemia. So every single time the leukemia tries to get a foothold, her immune system recognizes it and stops it. Why didn't you hear about this? Angela, did you hear about this before I showed you this? No, I didn't know that. Uh, but yeah. I have a good idea. I have an idea of why, <laughs> of why money, money, and the, you know, like a big corporation, and uh, well, it's the same as the the. I mean, the vaccine, you know, like just yeah, we, we're living this. Or oh, I mean, it's con it, it's uh, why the world is in in this state is just because we we don't make the vaccine available to the whole world. It's just as simple yeah. as that, and it's money. Exactly. So, I mean, in this case, what happened was all of this was paid for by taxpayers who, who funded the initial research. And then this team from Penn State and St. Jude Hospital, led by Dr. Carl June, and this was all funded by uh, this charity, completely funded by charity. And then once it showed promise, once they were sure that it worked, guess who swooped in and bought it up? Novartis. And it was funny because I followed this from the beginning all the way until more recently. If you read the New York Times, they would have an article about how Carl June and charity did this. And now when you read about it, they're like, Novartis did this. And it went from t being cheaper to do this under experimental conditions than getting a uh, bone marrow transplant, which is what they will usually try to do to cure your leukemia, to being... $500,000. This is what Novartis is charging for this gene therapy, which is way out of the reach of anyone. You will be paying for the rest of your life. And if you listen to these pharmaceutical companies, they'll say, well, look, it's your daughter's life. I mean, what can you put a price on that? No. So just pay and be, be grateful that we gave you this. Uh, this, is the, this is a huge problem where you have these brilliant people in the West making these breakthroughs, but then you also have these horrible people scooping it up and then exploiting it and dangling it over the head of everyone else on earth for, for money and power. It's, it's horrible. It's this duality where, again, like you say, Angelo, love, hate. Do you have some examples? And I'm going to check the well, comments. Other examples, the, the oil industry, the electric engine uh, existed a long, long time ago. It's not a recent invention. You know, when you had a combustion engine, you had a so electric engine. It was, it's not a new invention. So back in the old days, what the old industry did was just to, to buy whatever invention was existing just because they wanted people to, to use oil and they, they were controlling oil. So you see, uh, that's the danger. While uh, when you see uh, when in China, it's very different. You know, and, and China is not in a position, you know, it's dependent on, on importing oil. You know, it's very sensitive, so it had to find solutions. But but the problem is that we we need to question or you know the or, or societies about which are based about you know uh, about capitalism. You know, like, like uh, and um, and it's not for for common prosperity and for for the common good. And, and it's a pity because we're missing out opportunities. The world could be much better off. Imagine imagine just the fact that uh, how much money and resources are put into, you know, defense, defense, yeah. you know, I mean, we call it defense, we should at, uh, call it uh, attack. I mean, you know, you, uh, the US Department of Defense should never be called defense, you know, because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's about attacking. Think about this too. Imagine all of the money and energy put into the Western media, the corporate media lying about things like the New York Times lying about this gene therapy that has literally, it literally cures leukemia. It doesn't cure all cancer. There's a way to apply this to other cancers, but it's complicated. There's people working on it. 
This is actually happening in China also, by the way, this just gene therapy to treat uh, different types of cancer. Uh, but the, the problem is the, the media, they do not inform people that it's a literal cure for cancer. And this was not the leading story because they knew that big pharma would want to scoop this up and exploit it or bury it. Because as I see some people in the comment section, they're saying it's more, it's more profitable to sell a treatment for cancer for the duration of your life rather than getting a single treatment that cures it permanently. Where's the money in that? And this is the this is the primary problem with Western society right now is this obsession with profit over purpose to the point where profit is your purpose. And then again, it's like a tropism. You're just expanding without any purpose at all until all your resources are gone. And then you collapse. Again, empire, a cul-de-sac, a dead end. And um, this has happened to every single empire in history. And the West is the West today is not an exception to the rule. They will they will run, they, you see it happening. Uh, so yeah, yeah, there's Cuba also, the uh, lung cancer vaccine. There's there's all kinds of actual cures coming online for cancer, but it's not profitable. So this is, this is the issue. Pharm pharmaceutical corporations, the arms industry, oil, big tech, these are, these are the threats to humanity that we face now. And they've got the media telling you otherwise, that they're the saviors and everyone trying to undo what they're doing is the enemy. This is what it kind of boils down to. So I'm not anti-Western at all, I'm not anti-American. I'm anti these special interests that demonstrably are doing damage to Western society and to the rest of the planet. Uh, Angela, you have anything else? And then maybe we could take a few questions. No, I agree with you. It's, it's about humanity. Just looking at humanity, human being, just you know, focused on, on the human being and, and, um, and just, you know, this, uh, this fight between, I mean, the elites that want to control the human being and, and profit, profit for, from, from people while, while they, there is so much potential, you know, in terms of innovation. Imagine the, the world, how, how better it would be if, if, we were, if, if, if it was not all about money and, uh, and exploiting people. Absolutely. Uh, maybe we can take questions. Uh, if there, if if you see any questions in the comment section, or yeah, if you got a question, just put like a capital Q and then ask your question, and then we'll we'll try to answer it the best as we can. Uh, just you know, like like you were saying though, uh, th there's if you follow technology very closely, which I do because I, I'm an industrial designer by trade, and I'm very you know interested in technology, and I I work on designing and developing different types of technologies. So, you know, when you see all of the potential that right now in the 21st century, what is possible, and then you see how it's being squandered for profit, it's just so heartbreaking. Uh, if the if the media years ago, when this this gene therapy for leukemia, defeating entirely leukemia, if, if they promoted that and everyone got together, imagine where we would be right now, where everyone knows someone close to them who has gotten cancer, is either going through it, went through it, or was claimed by it. And this is something people don't have to go through. And when you realize the only reason why they have to is because of money and profits by a very small handful of people, it's, just, it's how does it not make your blood boil? That doesn't make you anti-American or anti-Western to feel that way because these people don't represent the US and they don't represent the West. They're a very small handful of people who have a outsized uh, say in things. And uh, I, I'm not, okay, so here's a question. Where does Indonesia fit into the greater Southeast Asia China conundrum? I think pretty much, uh, and then do Ch does China use Western medicine like big pharma products? So let's try to answer both, both of those. And then there's one on Elon Musk. So Indonesia, I think, falls into the equation the same way Thailand, Malaysia, Myanmar. There are people in Indonesia that want to work with the West, who are being paid by the West to create problems, to sabotage Asia's rise, Indonesia's rise, Asia's rise, and any relationship between Indonesia and China. And then there's people who are working to build ties and raise the region up collectively and raise Indonesia as a nation individually. And uh, I remember there was like a, a high-speed rail line project that Indonesia was working on with China. And like the day it was signed, there was like that week, some ISIS, you know, ISIS just suddenly showed up and started bombing things. It's so predictable. And we all know who's behind ISIS. It's the, the US and its regional uh, 
uh, allies in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Qatar. This is these are this network that they've created to torture and torment anyone that gets out of line. Um, Angelo, anything you want to say on that? Yes, I, I'd like to repeat that, uh, you know, a lot of people, they see that it's a contain containment of China. It is not. It's really, really important to understand that this is a, a containment of whole Asia. If there's a war with China, the whole Asia is going to suffer. You know, a lot of Asian countries, they benefit from the prosperity of China. It's a mutual win-win when it comes to economy. Uh, if we look at the whole picture, it's about containment of Asia and the whole global south. Because again, China, what, what China is doing right now through the Belt and Road Initiative, through in, reinvesting, recycling its US dollar trade surplus into the global south. You know, and so, so people need to look at the whole picture. So why Indonesia would rather side actually with China or be neutral? just because it knows that if there's a war with China, they are going to suffer from, from that, you know? So, so important to look at the, the whole picture. It's not only about China, it's the global South. Keep controlling, containing the, the global South because the West wants the global South to, to be poor and to keep, to keep this imperialistic system just going, going on for, for 100 more years. And so now we are living, and yeah, I mean, just, just it's a, it's a very interesting point. But what we we going through right now, it's the shift, you know. And the question is, is is going, is this shift going to be smooth and 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 no war and and uh, and people will be rational, or are we going towards a hot war? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and 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 then it boils down to that for pretty much any other issue too. So people were asking about Western pharmaceuticals and and China. Yes, of course they have they have. I wouldn't say Western. I mean it's just modern modern medical technology. There's scientists and researchers in every single country pursuing this. It's not it's not a Western thing. I mean maybe uh, two hundred years ago it was, but not anymore. It's a it's an international modern scientific pursuit of, of medical technology and pharmaceuticals. China is definitely involved in that. There are Western pharmaceutical corporations that do try to reach in and influence China. One of the biggest, uh, I think it was GSK, one of the biggest bribery rackets on earth in human history was GSK trying to buy people off in China and the Chinese government put a stop to it. And you should have saw the headlines when that happened. Uh, you know, the West acting like, why is China upset about this? I don't get it, you know? And then the GSK even tried to bribe the police who were investigating the bribery. This is how bad it is. Western pharmaceutical companies are some of the most corrupt corporations on earth in all of human history. And you have to think they're playing with people's lives. Their products, sometimes they, they bribe regulatory bodies to approve of products they know are going to kill people and they just don't care. And they do this everywhere. And there's like this, um, there's this battle going on that people don't realize where they do, they try to force these products on governments all over Asia, not just China. And governments are trying to provide affordable health care for their people. They have universal health coverage uh, in Thailand, for example. Uh, and so there's this, this constant war that you'll never hear mentioned in the media. I've written some articles about it, but I have not like focused on it entirely because there's so many other things going on, but yeah. Uh, big oil, big arms, pharmaceutical corporations, banks, it's all the same story. It's its them pushing and people trying to push back with local alternatives, which could be exactly the same thing, but just controlled by locals. So like if China could build up their research and development in terms of phar pharmaceuticals and provide this to their people and other countries for cheaper, this would be a step in the right direction because the there's dedicated, brilliant scientists working in the West, but they work for corporations that are horrific and corrupt and doing uh, immeasurable damage to humanity right now. This is, this is again, the duality of the West. And uh, to, to fix this, there needs to be more balance. Um, someone also said is, is that uh, Jan Marshall uh, getting kicked out of Thailand, is that the beginning of a, a seismic shift I don't think so, but I think it is a, an indicator that things are slowly shifting, where Asia is going to incrementally start pushing these people out. Things are definitely changing in Thailand. People's patience, uh, it's starting to run out for, uh, in regards to Western interference. Officially, 
and Westerners who are in Asia just looking down and abusing people in their own homes. Like the, the patience has run out for this. And I think you're going to see this incrementally increase where these people are not invited anymore. They're not welcomed anymore. And why should they? Uh, Angelo, any last thoughts? I think we're, we'll wrap it up. We're over one hour. Um, any last closing thoughts? Well, well you, you mentioned uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, well, remember, I mean, hundred years ago, it was a natural. It was more like natural medicines, and, and what happens is that you had, uh, you know, the big oligarch, U.S. oligarch, uh, like a Rockefeller. He started pouring lots of money into universities, and and what the people that were studying medicine, they were they were they had obligation to learn the chemical. Uh, pharmaceutical industry, you know, like new new methods. So so now you, when you talk to a doctor, uh, an average doctor doesn't know much about natural medicine. But in reality, uh, there were still there were all along solutions, but it was hijacked by by money and and those powerful people. And, and it's a pity you see this in pharmaceutical industry, oil industry, it, it, and it's a pity. It's it's uh, it's going against the uh, human being, uh, you know, interest. Yeah, and it's not to say that there is no benefit from modern pharmaceuticals, but uh, they will fix on it specifically for profit instead of having a wide variety and, and accepting that there's alternatives and accepting that there are extremely cheap, accessible, uh, open source solutions to problems. They don't want that. They want to control everything and they want you only paying into things that make them money. It's very sad. Uh, and this is a fight that we're going to have to, uh, Angela, uh, anything else? Yeah, no, just, just you know, just uh, uh, one example. In, in China, you know, uh, a doctor that is uh, that is actually treating you is actually doing prevention. So he, yeah. he's being paid if he does a, if you're not being sick. Uh, in the West, uh, the doctor is being paid because you become you became sick. You see the difference? Yeah, yeah. That that's definitely um. That there's well, we could probably do a whole episode on on healthcare. I think we probably should, uh, but. I want to thank everyone who joined us today. Uh, we kind of jumped all over the place because, you know, like, why are we actually anti-Western? We, we have to explain a, a, quite a lot. And that at, the, at the end of the day, we're not anti-Western. I'm not anti-American. Angela's not anti-Switzerland. You're in Switzerland right now, right, Angelo? <laughs> like, why would you be there if you no, hated I love Switzerland? It. I, I, yeah. I mean, you know, most Swiss, actually, it's a, it's a great system. I, I, I just love it. It's just, you know, just different. Switzerland is different, yeah. and China is China. It's just different. Yeah, and you know the only problem that we really have is when one country tries to impose itself on another, and I don't think that makes you anti anything except anti injustice. And we'll keep speaking up about it. Some people are like, "Why don't you say anything bad about Thailand?" Thailand's not invading other countries. Neither is China. When they do, well, we'll see. We'll see if we speak up about it or not. Right now, it's not. It's not even what aboutism. It's incomparable. The West is doing things that no one else on earth is doing right now. Injustice that no one else on earth is doing right now. So until that changes, this is how we do our business and uh, we're going to continue doing it. So thank you everyone for joining us. Angelo, again, thank, thank you, you as always, completely indispensable. Uh, we will be back next week. Uh, check the video description below for all of the links to the articles that we discussed. There's also ways you can follow me or Angelo on social media and uh, ways to support the new Atlas if you if you like. Uh, but even if you're just sharing this with other people, that helps out a lot. Thank you very much. And until next time, bye.